allows us to maintain the thermocrism in light scene. Uh, in two dimensions, I prefer the condition like that. What does it mean? In two dimensions, there's some two dimensional worksheet with some boundary. Well, okay, let me read it straight. Doesn't matter. But... And I keep, can pick coordinates parallel and perpendicular to the boundary. And then the component parallel perpendicular for the stress tensor should vanish. Not that this can be interpreted as the energy flux coming out of the boundary. So this, tenure, this boundary does not produce energy or absorb energy. Now, suppose I'm given a theory of a scalar field, or a free massless scalar field, say. Massive too, doesn't matter. So how would I make sure that this condition holds? Um, well, so this component of the stress tensor is essentially this. So an actual way to make sure that this holds is that is to either make sure that the derivative of the scalar field along the boundary vanishes, or that the derivative perpendicular to the boundary vanishes. These two conditions are usually denoted as Norman or Dirichlet boundary conditions. You surely encounter them in electron, say in electron, when you're studying electromagnetism. So Neumann boundary conditions set to zero the perpendicular component of the first derivative of the scalar field. This is pretty much the boundary condition which emerges naturally if you do some variational problem. Because if you're given some action, on the manifold with boundary, you want to make sure that it is stationary. If you let your field vary freely, including in the manifold and at the boundary, I'll try to make sure that this is zero. You integrate it by parts. To get the equations of motion. But there is a boundary term. So if your variations are free, your variations of scalar fields are free, say in your path integral, you get normal boundary conditions naturally. Unless you add some extra terms to the action, which just leave it the boundary. We'll do so at the, at the end of the lecture, but for now, this is it. On the other hand, the other possibility, which is the recurrent boundary conditions, is to set the scalar field to be some constant at the boundary. This also kills the boundary term because it's just killing by hand the fluctuation of the field at the boundary. Say so by path integral will be a path integral over all values of all the configurations of the field which go to a constant at the boundary. So these are directly boundary conditions. And of course this implies that the derivative along the boundary of x is zero. So both these boundary conditions classically satisfy this, con this constraint. And they actually satisfy quant quantum mechanically too. <coughs> Nothing goes wrong uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, I mean, so if there is something else living at the boundary, right. this this will change. 
Of For example, if I had an extra field that lives at the boundary, there will be some coupling of x to some operator. Okay. Made out of the boundary fields. And then the variation will bring this operator here on the right hand side. So indeed, in the electromagnetism, you get something like the current here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Another possibility is if I add something like x squared to the boundary. then this will give me derivative of x proportional to x. It's called the mixed boundary condition. It's, it's useful for, for some purposes, but it typically breaks conformal invariance, scale invariance. Mm -hmm. So right, So what the boundary conditions are OK. What boundary conditions can be used to define a simple brain, a simple deep, deep brain? Uh, I thought, strictly speaking, the name D-Brain came about when people realized that instead of doing this on all the directional space time, they could actually do this to so the declared brain. I think that was the origin of the name. But uh, if I define a D-Brain just as something that pokes holes, puts boundaries in my worksheets, the natural way to define a D-Brain is to pick Neumann on some directions, the declare on some other direction. So if I want to define, say, a DP brain, I would take normal boundary conditions for the coordinates from x0 all the way to xd, and directly for the remaining coordinates. So this, this gives me an object which, roughly speaking, you know, constrains my, the, the endpoints of my strings to live at some fixed location in these directions and to move freely in these directions. You mean P, not D? Yes. Thank you. So roughly speaking, my, 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 the endpoints of my strings will be attached to some P plus one dimensional object. Now, of course, you can always add or act on this with some Lorentz transformation. This will give you some generalization of this, where some linear combination of the scalar fields have Neumann, some other linear combination has Dirichlet. But you see, uh, if you look at the stress tensor, let me put the Lorentz indices. The basic condition is roughly that the directional sessions which have been replaced are orthogonal to the directions which are normal. So my, my tabling rule is defined as a sort of orthogonal splitting of space time. The directions which are along the brain and the directions which are orthogonal to the brain. Now, uh, I've been stressing out before that the the string theory has no continuous parameters. This looks like a continuous parameter, the position of the libre. But as we'll see momentarily, it actually is a dynamical field. But as you, when you start, your, your libre is just an infinitely heavy, rigid plane stretching across space time. Now, Perturbatively, I mean, when you, when you start working perturbation theory, you, you, can see, you will see that this d brain actually is not infinitely heavy. It has a mass or a tension of order 1 over g string. Okay. So this actually follows from the fact that it is a source of order g string for the gravity. And the coupling, gravitational coupling is this thing squared. OK. So then. 
So now there are some boundary conditions. There are two sorts of questions which we might want to answer. The first one is, if I use this D brain, I put it in space time, which sort of closed string strings is going to source? So if I have my, my string diagram, I should just have it etched on the blackboard. And I add boundary to the worksheet. Sources. Mm. Closed strings. Which closed string does it source? To study this problem, what you want is to study a cylinder geometry. with the boundary placed at some moment in tau. This problem will tell you which sources. The other question you can ask is to study the here in a strip a ribbon. With some boundary conditions here. Here I have just one choice of boundary condition. Here I can have two choices of boundary conditions, different ones, at the two endpoints. This will tell me which sort of open strings are there in the system if I add D brains, D1. So, in a sense, so I start with this one because it's a little bit easier in the sense that you already know what, are, how, what is the theory on a, on a cylinder. You know what are the states of the theory in a cylinder. So we need to try to figure out is which states are created by putting a boundary at the origin of, of Euclidean time. So remember that the the scalar has an expansion Sort. So, suppose I want to put normal boundary conditions for the scalar field at tau equal to zero. It means I want the tau derivative of x to vanish at tau equal to zero. That sort of creates. So the state created by this boundary must satisfy the property that a n minus a bar minus n kills it. And also p on the state is 0. It's just a, I'm just fully expanding the condition the tau x equal to 0 at tau equal to 0. So how do we solve these constraints? Well, first of all, to solve this one, we built our state out of the vacuum. And to satisfy this constraint, you just need something like that. OK. So this is the state which is created. Uh, by a normal boundary condition. So it's a state which has no momentum. And it contains all sorts of oscillators. So that means that the closed strings created by a D brain have no momentum in the directions along the D brain. That makes sense. If a source is uniform and extended along some direction, 
it will not source fields which have momentum in the direction. And the other observation is that it will source all closed string states, roughly the same intensity. So it's a, the deep brain is a source for the tachyon, the graviton, the B, but also for whatever higher excited states of, this, of string theory. On the other hand, if I do the Reclay boundary conditions, I only get the condition that a n plus a bar minus n feels the state. So, of course, I also need to impose that x acting on the state is x naught. So I'm trying to impose that x at tau equal to 0 equal to x naught. So again, if we re-expand this constraint, then I get this. So again, it's relatively simple to, to solve these constraints. By the way, these sort of constraints you might have encountered when you're studying the harmonic oscillator, for example, or quantization. Um, They, they sort of had to do it. I mean, they, they are, well, okay, there's not much to say. <laughs> they're interesting. They're, they're not coherent states, right? They're not exponen exponentials of one uh, oscillator. There's something called squeeze state, I guess, exponentials of bilinears. But the coefficient here is such as it's actually a delta, roughly it's a delta function. The state. It's just the Fourier transform of delta function for the derivative of x. And here I get the Fourier transform of a delta function uh, for the zero mode. So this is, this, is the sort of, this is the sort of state which is created by the Riclebanary condition. So again, I'm creating, I'm going to create all sorts of oscillators for the, for the strings. I'm going to create closed string states with every sort of uh, excitations. But crucially, I also, I'm, this, the Riclebanary conditions create sources fields with every sort of momentum. Again, this makes sense. If it's something localized, it sources uh, all momenta uniformly with a profile e to the ipx naught. So this is really the Fourier transform of a delta function. This d brain uh, at the leading order in perturbation theory, it's an infinitely thin object sitting at x naught and sourcing all sorts of closed strings. So the picture is really. That this endpoint of the worksheet literally ends on some plane in space time. Also, this sort of should tell you that, well, okay. So it should be clear that the, if the deep brains are infinitely heavy, this might be okay. You know, you're generating a state with momentum, but uh, you're infinitely heavy, you can recoil infinitesimally, and it's okay. If these deep brains have a finite mass, then they will have to recoil in a process like that. Because the mass is of order. Uh, one of a G string, the recoil is sort of perturbative in size and appears in Hager order in perturbation theory. It's actually very similar to an infrared effect in quantum field theory. Uh, it's actually pretty messy to account for properly, but uh, 
doable. Mm -hmm. You're yes. saying um, P plus one directions would have the Neumann boundary conditions yes. and the rest would have a DHS. So now you've written for one scalar, yes. uh, it could be Neumann or DHS. Mm -hmm. So when we have more, I mean, what is the total state, the one that? Um, uh, okay, that sorry, yes. So, so what is the state for the P plane? I want to integrate over the transverse directions. Uh, Transverse momentum to the i the transverse, not x, but of the position of the the plane mm -hmm. in the transverse direction. That was short. Of the plane. Uh, so using transverse pole is not a terribly good idea because I use it for the worksheet. It's meant in space time hypothesis. Yes. Uh, let me just leave it. <coughs> and then you get this sort of exponentials. Actually, I might be able to explore this a little bit farther. So, so which sort of states are there hidden in this object? So, should we saw some tangent? That's true, and that's boring. The D brain is a point like it's a localized source for the tangent. But the next thing with source is actually a, a graviton. And then the next object is a is a graviton. Uh, so So, see, at the, we are sourcing one of the massless fields in our ring spectrum. The indices are symmetric, so I'm not sourcing any B field. I'm sourcing graviton and dilaton. Hmm? Sorry? Here there is. No, and the, the, the line above is the subscript gains. Yes. Are we yes. over this? That's right. They should put things out of there. So this deep range source the caviton and source the, source the dilaton. Some kinds of brains will make the dilaton become very small near the brain. So perturbation theory is better and better as you approach the brain. Some other brains, some other brains make the dilaton bigger and bigger as you approach them, which means the perturbation theory is actually worse and worse to describe their neighborhood. And this solves the graviton. Uh, so this solves the graviton like a I mean, if you're trying to try to write down this, this uh, coupling to the graviton as, as a stress tensor of some dynamical object, uh, this is really the stress tensor you, you would associate with a, with a brain, something that looks like that. Uh, 
So you get something like a, you know, an energy density uh, in the directions along the, the object. Uh, sorry, I want to do this properly. Maybe I'll, I'll wait. Yeah, I'll wait uh, to that later in the lecture to explain what the physical meaning of this opposite sign or the components along the brain and the components perpendicular uh, to the brain. For now, let's just study open strings for a bit. <coughs> the simplest thing to look at is to ask which open strings leave attached to a normal brain. Yes? Conditions. Yeah, so there is a, there is an action. We'll hopefully, get to the end of to, to, to the end of the lecture. There is an action for uh, for the D brain, which uh, tells you a leading order in alpha prime, leading order in the curvature, which shape uh, the D brain would like to take in a gravitational field. So, which open strings uh, can live? Attached to a normal brain. So you need to study the, the scalar field on a strip with normal boundary conditions at sigma equal to zero and sigma equal to pi. So it's not very difficult to write down the Fourier expansion of a scalar field with this boundary condition. I'll write it like that. So here we're doing open strings. Compare this Fourier expansion with the Fourier expansion on the cylinder, you notice two differences. First of all, we essentially identified A's and A bars. A way to understand that is that normal boundary conditions, which now are the sigma x equal to zero. Uh, can be written in holomorphic coordinates as the S, X, I. Uh, you see, I think I defined it that the S was tau minus I sigma, if I remember correctly. So the sigma derivative looks like this. So in normal moderate conditions, so to tie together the holomorphic and antihomorphic parts of X. That's ultimately the reason for which we ended up uh, identifying a N and A bars. Another small difference is the normalization of the momentum. So in order for, for the momentum, the momentum <coughs> to be still fundamentally conjugate to the zero mode, I need to change the normalization slightly. A way to understand that is that P is supposed to be the zero mode it is a moment associated to, is a conserved current, is conserved charge associated to the translations, to shifts of the scalar field. <coughs> so it's written as the integral over your space, over space of the current, the tau x. So here we are integrating the tau x from 0 to 2 pi. Here I'm integrating it from 0 to pi. So to get the same normalization of p, I need an extra factor of 2. And now, everything is pretty much identical to what we did for closed strings, actually simpler. 
because I only have one set of oscillators and not two set of oscillators. So the Hilbert space of open strings will have a bunch of momentum eigenstates given by the negative by the positive A's, and I will build on them with the negative A's. Sourcing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. How can, how, can you, how can you have a uh, brain sourcing such a thing? Take this picture and cut it. And what follow the, the worksheet, not easy to visualize, but you see it starts on the Libre, it goes around and comes back to the Libre. If you take, try to take a, a picture of this at a fixed time slice, you actually have a propagation on the geometry like this. But doesn't that, that only give you boundary conditions on one end of the open No, both. both. See, if you, well, let me just form this picture. Well, okay, yeah. just follow a path for an open string. I mean, open string has two ends. So it's going to start from here, it's going to go around the pictures, and come back here. Now, if I have multiple brains, I could have open strings which have one choice of brain here and a different choice of brain here. And I'll do this momentarily. So, So what sort of, what, is a, what could the spectrum of physical states be? You already essentially did the calculation before because to study the cross string, we're looking at one set of oscillators and then the other set and putting the results together. So here the physical states are gonna be vacuum, except that, that because of this difference in normalization, p square is now one half instead of two. And then I have some massless object. Yeah, perhaps I should say that the Casimir energy here is still minus one. So the conditions for a physical state are still that L0 equal to minus one, equal to one, and L and kill it. For n positive. The only difference is that L0 is now uh, 2p squared plus the number of uh, oscillators acted upon. And the null state, so the, there is this condition, and also there is a condition that epsilon mu p mu is 0. And the null states are the ones where epsilon mu is multiple of the mu. Okay, these conditions will seem very, very familiar. This is just the gauge field. So uh, normal, whenever you have normal matter conditions in a brain, you have gauge fields. So there are gauge fields whose polarization uh, points along your brain. So if you put normal number conditions in all your direction space-time, you have a brain which is just filling space-time. And this brain supports open strings, which include a vacuum and a gauge field. Now if I take multiple, multiple copies of the same brain, then I get a matrix of open string fields. Because I can pick any copy of the brain I want here and here. And as a result, my open strings will be matrices, I get gauge fields, value matrices, which are non-abelian gauge fields. So the emergence of non-abelian gauge theories on brains was one of the main reasons people got so excited about brains at the very beginning. 
So it's fun. We, we are encountering one by one all things that are fun in, in theoretical physics. We got a graviton from closed strings, now we got a, a gauge field from open strings. Now, if you want to know what happens to events which are not space stealing, we need to look at direct lay boundary conditions. So for some of the scalar fields in the brain, I have direct lay boundary conditions. Uh, so suppose for now I'm studying this, the open strings, the stretch between the brain and itself. So both boundary conditions set x to some x naught at the boundary. This is this is going to give rise to non-Abelian gauge fields. Yes. Uh, where does the non-Abelian index go? I mean, so suppose we have multiple copies of a. What does it mean to have multiple multiple copies of a brain? Now this is something. So with relation string theory, it actually makes sense in in quantum field theory too. So you can have boundary conditions which are a direct sum of some other boundary conditions. And what that means is that the Hilbert space on the strip is actually a direct sum of the Hilbert spaces between boundary condition I and boundary condition J. Now, if your boundary conditions are all the same, so if you have n copies of the same boundary condition, that becomes the tensor product between the, the Hilbert space between boundary condition itself and c to the n squared. So there are n, n squared copies of your vacuum, n squared copies of the first state, and so on. So the way to think about it is that your ground states are labeled by the momentum, and which of the brains you have on the left, and which of the brains you have on the right. So they are matrices. Now what's not trivial is that the actual scattering of these open strings is going to give you the same constraints as the Nobelian gauge theory. Uh, but in a sense, it's, uh, it's forced on you by the fact that quantum field theory, the string theory reproduces quantum field theory at low energy. And there is a theorem in quantum field theory that whenever you have this sort of <coughs> situation, uh, you have a gauge theory based on some legal. So if you have the other condition, you lose your momentum. So open strings which are attached to a D-brain cannot move away from the D-brain. Perhaps not surprising. But you still have the oscillators. So, uh, so if you have some DP-brain, Okay, maybe I should call it VD. I don't confuse it, momentum P. Uh, if I put together information about all the scalar fields, my ground states will be labeled by momentum, which, which has only components <laughs> in the normal mandala conditions, along the normal directions. I'll, I'll have a tachyon, and I'll have some masses state. And now it's useful to separate the directions along the brain and direction perpendicular to the brain. So this gives me still a gauge field. Yes, 
shield, but uh, which lives on the brain, literally. So, in particular, has components only along the brain. You can see your gauge symmetry uh, only involves component along the brain. And then there are a bunch of extra fields which have the index of space-time, which is perpendicular to the brain. And these are just the position, the, the fluctuations in the position. So the massless modes of the open strings on the brain include this funny gauge field, uh, for which I cannot, I mean, I, I don't have a good intuitive reason to say why there should be a gauge field on the, on the, on the D-brain. But they also include some fields which describe this fluctuations of the brain. Uh, so this shows you that, as I, as I mentioned, that parameter over there is not a continuous parameter, it's really the wave of a scalar field the wave of the degree of freedom. Now, and you want the fact that, so the fact that if you have a, uh, Actually, let me use this guy over here, sorry. So now suppose that you have several DP brains which are coinc coincident. Yeah. So all the fields, all, all the open strings that live on these brains are matrices. Just because, you know, an open string can Start from one brain and then on the other. Now that the gauge fields are matrices seems intuitive physically. Okay, quite intuitive. I mean, again, difficult to understand perhaps, but not so strange. I have a gauge field, it's non abelian. I didn't know where the gauge fields came from. I don't know where these non abelian gauge fields come from, but it's fine. But the, the, the positions become matrices, perhaps, is what's most striking. So we have several n coincident coincident D-brains. Somehow the fluctuations of these D-brains away from each other are described by matrices instead of by n fields. It's a very peculiar and interesting feature. Again, it's another hint that geometry really doesn't work the same way as short distances for string theory as it works uh, for quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, this will be surprising. But maybe not completely surprising. In the sense, if I have a quantum field theory, I have a bunch of solitons, and I bring them together, it's possible that new degrees of freedom actually uh, appear when the solitons come together. So perhaps it's not completely shocking. Now, when the demons are separated, At some large distance, we would expect our normal sane geometric intuition to, to hold. So if I have two brain, D brains which are separated by a vast distance, I don't expect strange string, string theory effects to, 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 to happen. Now, indeed, if you study an open string fresh between two D brains like that, You write your free more expansion of the field, you find an extra crucial term, which allows x to go from x0 to x1 if you transverse across the strip. 
that essentially modifies the the energy of your state. It's like a contribution to your to your uh, a not or a not bar. So that this so that now the uh, the mass of particles is shifted by uh, x e o times x one squared over eight pi squared. So, for example, if the so if the, if the strings are if, if the, as long as the brain gets separated, the massless modes are not massless anymore; they become massive. So, in particular, this funny of diagonal components of the position uh, become very massive and negligible. Even the tachyon stops being a tachyon if the separation is sufficiently large. I should perhaps mention that the open string tachyon is much uh, less troublesome than the closed string tachyon. So the closed string tachyon represents an instability which we fully do not understand. We don't know what happens to bosonic string theory if the tachyon follows, if the closed string tachyon falls down from its potential. On the other hand, uh, if the open string tachyon falls down from its, its potential, uh, and you sort of ignore the closed string tachyon, all that happens is the d brain actually disappears. So uh, the, the open string tachyon really just represents the fact that these, the d brains are unstable solitons in, in bosonic string. In super strings, some d brains will be stable and have no tachyon. Some others will be unstable and have a tachyon. Uh, OK, so the. The short version of this is that uh, right, so D brains support fluctuation modes, they support the gauge field. When they are well separated, there are some extra very massive degrees of freedom which have to do with open strings stretched across through the two, two brains. When they get close, something fancier happens, get extra massless states, extra light states, which really reinterpret the geometry. And uh, this is a bit, res you know, this should resemble the things that I said about the duality. Uh, there are very nice interplays between difference and the duality. In the sense that you can take your theory on a circle, put some difference in, make the circle small, do a duality to, to describe the theory in terms of the dual big circle, and ask which difference are there in the new theory. It just turns out that the duality exchanges Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. So if you start from a space filling brain, you do a T-duality, you end up with a brain localized uh, at some position in space. And usually in textbooks, that's how D-brains are, direct boundary conditions are introduced. So in textbooks like Borchinsky, they will first introduce for you Neumann boundary conditions, space filling brains, and open string modes that just propagate everywhere in space time. And then they'll do a T-duality and discover the localized brains. Now, uh, last thing we can do about d brains. So we, here we saw some infinitesimal fluctuations, you know, some uh, something like the uh, gravitons we saw in the in the clustering. But for the for the gravitons, we we also saw that we can get an effective action. We can really find gravity uh, by studying the motion of strings in some background, and requiring this to be a consistent problem. So in a similar way, uh, what we can do is to explore more intricate boundary conditions for your scalar field theory. So instead of studying just pure Dirichlet or pure Neumann, you could do something more interesting. For example, you could say, I want to define a boundary condition for my, for my scalar fields, such that the scalar fields at the boundary belong to some manifold in space-time. And then, classically, to, have, to, have, to satisfy the constraints, all, it's sufficient to require that the normal derivative or the scalar fields uh, should live in the tangent 
the manifold. Now, now you can, so you can study this theory quantum mechanically. And try to figure out what's going to happen. And uh, quantum mechanically, that equation will not hold. Now, this boundary condition is still, but still preserves time translations. I mean, translation in one direction. So you still have a conservation law. But the, you know, the conservation law is sort of weaker than the condition. See, what could happen, is, for example, is uh, something like that. Some condition like that will still allow you to write down a conservation law. Because if, you, if you're integrating on space, uh, uh, your energy density. Uh, so, and you try to see if it's conserved. You can still apply the conservation law. Uh, sorry, am I getting myself uh, confused? No, it's fine. Uh, so you can rewrite this as uh, Now this makes sense. So usually you, if you know no boundary, you just integrate this, you get zero, you get your conservation law. With the boundary, you get this extra term. But if it's actually equal to this, the parallel T, then you can have a conservation law where the energy has a bulk contribution and a boundary contribution. So if there is some energy density which can live at the boundary, then energy can flow in and out. This is just telling you the amount of energy which flows into the boundary equals to the change in the energy density at the, living at the boundary. Uh, so, but if you want to really have uh, diffeomorphism while invariance, you need this to vanish. So this is like the vanishing of the trace of the stress tensor in the bulk, the condition which is needed to have uh, consistent pair of strings propagating with this boundary condition. Another way to think about it is that there is sort of a beta function for this. There is a beta function for the shape of this manifold. The shape of this manifold will change as you change the scale. And uh, so it's so possible to write down an effective action for this, which tells you which boundary conditions are OK. In a sense, gives you equations of motion for the D-brain. So, that is manifold in space time. And I, set some, I, I pick some local coordinates on the manifold. We call them V1 all the way, V0 all the way to Vd. I can describe this manifold as a sort of an embedding. And there is the effective action. It's it's what you would naively expect. It's just the square root of the determinant of the induced volume form. So it's it's just the it's just the volume of the D brain. So we find the number go to action again, but for D brain instead of for string. You 
can even include a, a metric in space time. Uh, I think it's something like that. So, so just by studying the RG flow properties of boundaries, you can find the equation of motion to tell you how the D-brain moves. This is first order in alpha prime, and then there are corrections. Uh, now, you can also include the gauge field. The way you include the gauge field is by adding a term to the action, which is just uh, it's the same. It's the same coupling you would use to couple a particle to a gauge field. Now you are you are coupling the endpoint of your string to the gauge to gauge field. And uh, so this capping governs the correspond to the introduction of this gauge field over there. And then I guess you can also couple the token as usual. The open string token. As a sort of a more boring capping. So this is just I'm just I didn't have time to go over the state operator map for Operators on the boundary, unfortunately. But roughly, this object, if we further expand it, is the, is the operator which corresponds to the state. And on the other hand, if you really want to make sure to understand why this operator, this state, is what corresponds to movements of the libre. You can try to ask yourself what sort of boundary action would you add to a directed boundary condition to change the directed boundary condition, to change x naught. Okay. Questions? Sorry, a couple of questions. So, were we saying that uh, the equations of motion that you wrote out for the brain, they come from? I have I have some non-vanishing current that you're saying, but I, what you're saying, imposing while invariance, I get the equations of motion such that uh, while invariance is satisfied. And so, very roughly, uh, for example, you can ask yourself when is that even simpler than while invariance? When is that you have scale invariance? So roughly the current for the scaling transformation is something like x, roughly. It's not the size, but it's x mu t mu nu. So you can ask, we need this conserved. Uh, and uh, so you, you, you can you can really try to figure out no, if this would allow that to be conserved. If I it's not, there's a violation which is exactly the. So, so what I'm asking is these equations of motion, this action that you wrote down, yes. brain, that comes from constraining your current heat. Ah, yes, yes, yes. So, yes, constraining heat. So, uh, this T is, in a for a generic boundary condition, this T is going to be uh, at various terms, and then we'll have something like, uh, you know, O. Mu the parallel x mu a, and this O will be the functional, will be the same as the. This this O will be the equation of motion for my for my brain, and will look like del s over del y mu. <laughs> I never did this calculation. Actually, don't haven't seen it in a textbook, but I believe this is the the way. The equations would come out. Um, <coughs> so check me on this. <laughs> you 
had said maybe he would say something more about the opposite signs in that. Uh, oh, uh, <coughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so, suppose I have something like that. What sort of source do I get from a Gallica? So, if I do a variation with respect of G, so this, this couples only to the components of G along, uh, along the plane. Now, uh, now the source for the graviton. So this, this shows you that uh, sort of the, the components parallel to the brain, the components perpendicular to the brain, are treated in a bit of a different uh, way. The stress tensor, uh, sorry. I mean, suppose that your brain is just you know, flat and uh, extends along, along space time. Right. So, then you get really screwed to the determinant of G in mean, but not, not all, all the G you know, 0 to B plus 1, 0 to B plus 1. So when you do a variation to get your stress tensor, it will uh, it will involve especially all the all the components along uh, along the brain. Now. Uh, The, the contribution of the, the state I was writing up there included a contribution of like happening to the graviton and to the diaton. Uh, so that's why you, you get uh, both sets of uh, components. I mean, what is, for example, the stress tensor for a particle? Suppose you have a particle coupled to, 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 the, uh, to the graviton, to gravity. The stress tensor in space time is something like that, if I remember correctly, where u is the, is the velocity, is the full velocity of your particle. For example, a static particle contributes to t0,0. Zero, zero. I think this is correct. Now, I've been, I'm not being very uh, precise on how you disentangle the graviton and the dilaton for lack of time. So, uh, see, it's always possible to do a redefinition of coordinates that defines your metric by some power of the dilaton. And this remixes your equations of motions a little bit. So there are various frames they are called, different choices on which power the on how to disentangle the graviton of the dilaton. It's something called the the strings the string metric or the Einstein metric. So there is a choice for which the action for the gravity is really that the Einstein Einstein uh, action. In different choices are right, the sources between the dilaton and the graviton mix up in different ways. Uh, so in one, I guess in the, in the Einstein frame, it must be true that uh, you only get, I'm sorry, I did not do the calculation in detail, so I don't want to say things that are wrong. I have probably already said several things which are incorrect for the last five minutes, and it's not recorded, but that's life. 
Uh, any other questions?